Chapter 11 of Danger in Deep Space. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Danger in Deep Space by Kerry Rockwell. Narrated by Sam Holloway. Chapter 11. Cadet Higgins! Major Connell's voice roared over the ship's intercom as the giant rocket cruiser Polaris blasted smoothly through space. Yes, sir, squeaked Alfie in reply. Cadet Higgins! said Connell. I thought I had requested a sight on the Sunstar Regulus at 1500 hours! You did, sir, replied Alfie. Then why? By the craters of Luna, don't I have that position? I was busy, sir, came the meek reply. Cadet Higgins, sighed Connell patiently. Would you be so kind as to come down to the control deck? In the short space of time since their departure from the space station, Major Connell had learned that to scold Cadet Higgins was not the way to gain his attention. In fact, Major Connell had not been able to find a way of getting the little cadet's attention in any manner, at any time, on anything. I can't right now, sir, replied Alfie. What do you mean, you can't? exploded Connell. I mean, sir, explained Alfie, that I've just sighted Tara, and I have to get a position check on her before we go any further, to ensure that we traverse the same trajectory on our return trip and thus avoid the problem of finding a new and safe route back. Cadet Alfie Higgins! Connell's voice climbed to a frenzied shriek. If you are not on this control deck in ten seconds, I'll personally see that you are fed to a dinosaur when we touch down at Tara, and you will never return. Now get down here! Tom and Astro, who could hear the conversation over the intercom, were finding it very difficult to keep from laughing out loud at the innocence of Alfie and the outraged wrath of Major Connell. Tom, particularly had discovered that Alfie's innocent refusal to be bullied by Connell had made the time pass more quickly on the long haul through deep space. More than once he had seen Major Connell rage against the underweight cadet and become even more frustrated at his childlike resistance. It had helped Tom forget the empty feeling he experienced every time he called the radar deck and heard Alfie's mild voice instead of Roger's usual mocking answer. Astro, too, had managed to forget the loneliness he felt aboard the great cruiser by watching the antics of Alfie and Major Connell. More than once he had instigated situations where Alfie would get caught red-handed in a harmless error, and then he lay flat on the power deck, laughing until his sides ached as he listened to Alfie and Major Connell over the intercom. It had helped. Both Tom and Astro admitted it had helped. But it still didn't take away the dull ache each felt when an occasional remark, situation, or thought would bring Roger to mind. Tom flipped the teleceiver on and waited for the blank screen to show him Tara. Connell stood to one side, also watching for the image of the planet to take form on the grey-black screen. A hatch clanked behind them, and Alfie stepped into the control deck to snap to his version of attention. Gannett Higgins reporting, sir, he said quietly. Connell stepped in front of him, placed his hands on his hips, and bent slightly, pushing his face almost into Alfie's. Cadet Higgins, I want you to know I have taken all the blasted space-brained antics I'm going to take from you, said Connell quietly. Yes, sir, replied Alfie blandly. And, said Connell, shaking a finger in Alfie's face. And if there is one more, just one more brazen flagrant disregard of my specific orders then cadet higgins i promise you the most miserable trip back to earth you will ever know in your entire career i promise you i'll make you sweat i'll i'll connell stopped short and shuddered Alfie's owl-eyed look of innocence seemed to unnerve him. He tried to resume his tirade, but the words failed him. He finally turned away, growling. Higgins! 
get up on that radio dock and do as you're told, when you're told to do it, and not when you want to do it. Is that clear? Yes, sir, said Alfie meekly. He saluted and returned to the radar deck. Corbett, snapped Connell. If I should appear to be losing control of myself when addressing Cadet Higgins, you have my official permission to restrain me. Use force if necessary. Tom bit his lip to keep from laughing and managed to mumble. Yes, sir. He turned quickly to the control board and began focusing on the planet lying dead ahead of the decelerating spaceship. They had been slowing down for several days, since their speed with the added hyperdrive had been increased greatly. The young cadet adjusted the last dial and the blue-green planet sprang into clear, sharp focus on the screen. Why? gasped Tom. Sir, look, it's just like Earth. In more ways than one, Corbett, replied Connell. What's our range? I'd say we're close enough to reduce thrust to a quarter regular space speed, sir. Very well, said Connell. Now, uh, look to the right on the screen. See that small dark patch over there in the middle of the planet? Yes, sir, replied Tom. That's where we want to touch down, said Connell. You stay here in the control deck and manoeuvre the ship closer in while I go to the radar deck and contact Space Academy on the transmitter. I've got to report that we expect to land soon. Very well, sir, said Tom. He turned and flipped the intercom switch. Uh, control deck to power deck, he said. Check in, Astro. Power deck here, replied Astro. What's up, Tom? We just got our first good look at Tara. She's dead ahead. Major Connell's going to contact Space Academy, and I'm going to manoeuvre into our preliminary glide. Stand by for course changes. Make it an easy touchdown. I want to get home, you know, replied Astro good-naturedly. OK, said Tom. Better bring her down to one-quarter space speed. Hyper or regular? Asked Astro. Regular? Yelled Tom. You give me a quarter on hyper and we'll go right through the planet. One-quarter regular space speed, replied Astro. Tom adjusted his controls for the speed reduction, while keeping his eyes on the teleceiver screen. He watched the planet grow larger before his eyes, and the terrain become more distinct. He could see two large oceans, the green-blue of the water reflecting the sunlight of Alpha Centauri brilliantly. Nearer and nearer the Polaris plummeted, and Tom could begin to distinguish the rough outline of mountain ranges along the horizon line. He switched to a larger view of the planet on the magnoscope that revealed a splendour rivalling the beauty of his own cherished Earth. We'll be entering the atmosphere in a minute, Alfie, yelled Tom into the intercom. Stand by to give range for touchdown. Radar deck, aye, reported Alfie. Range at present, 500 miles. Power deck, check in, yelled Tom. Power deck, aye, returned Astro. All set below, asked Tom. All set, said Astro. Reduce thrust to minimum, shouted Tom. Deep inside the powerful ship, the roar of the mighty atomic rocket motors began to fade to a deep growling purr. Control deck to radar deck. Major Connell, sir. What is it, Corbett? Asked Connell. We're ready for a touchdown. Do you want to take over the bridge? Can't you do it, Corbett? Asked Connell. Yes, sir, replied Tom. Then carry on, replied Connell. I'm having some trouble trying to get through to the academy on the transmitter. Can't understand it. There was a pause. I have them now, Corbett. You carry on, he shouted. Aye, aye, sir, said Tom. He turned his attention to the control panel, checking the many dials and gauges with one sweeping glance, and then concentrated on bringing the ship to a safe landing on the foreign planet. His fingers tingled as he reached for the switches that would bring the ship down on the first intergalactic world he had ever visited. In a flash, the curly-haired cadet remembered childhood dreams of doing just what he was doing now at this moment, preparing to touch down on a new world, millions of miles away from his home near New Chicago. Range 100 miles, reported Alfie over the intercom. Power deck, reduce thrust to absolute minimum, ordered Tom. I want as little sustaining power as you can give me without cutting out altogether, Astro. Can do, said Astro. The ship slowed even more, and then suddenly picked up speed again as the gravity of Tara began to tug at the space traveller. Stand by to fire braking rockets, yelled Tom. He was all nerves now, sensitive to the throbbing of the great ship's motors, eyes fastened to the dials and meters on the control panel. There was no time to watch the scanner view of the onrushing planet now. He had to touch down blindly, using only his instruments. Radar bridge report, snapped Tom. Range 1,000 feet, reported Alfie, his calm voice in striking contrast to the nervous excitement in Tom's. 750, 600, 
550. Fire braking rockets. Rasped Tom into the intercom. The great ship bucked under the sudden thrust of the huge braking rockets. The Polaris held steady for a moment. Then gradually, as the pull of Tara began again, she settled back toward the dark green jungles beneath her. 250 feet, reported Alfie. 175. 150. He droned. Ease her up, Astro, shouted Tom. Easy, ease her up, you Venusian clunk. We're dropping too fast. Once again, from the heart of the Polaris, there came a roaring blast of the powerful motors. The ship steadied once more and then slipped back into her fall toward the new planet under more sure control. 50 feet, reported Alfie. 40, 30, 20. There was a brief pause, as if everything had stopped and they were held still by a giant hand. And then, suddenly, a rocking motion, a slight bump and rumble. Tom knew that they were down. Touchdown! He yelled at the top of his voice. Touchdown! We made it! We made it! From the power deck, quiet except for the whining of the oxygen feed pump, Astro's bellow could be heard vibrating through the passageways. Tom began shutting off the many circuits and switches and made a quick last-minute check of the now-dead ship. Satisfied, he glanced at the great solar clock, noted the time in the log, and stepped to the ladder leading to the radar bridge. Cadet Corbett reporting, sir, said Tom, saluting smartly. I wish to report, sir, that the Polaris made touchdown on the planet Tara at exactly 1759 solar time. Connell, his great bulk bent over the tiny transmitter, was twirling the dials, his head encased in a vacuum earphone helmet to ensure perfect silence. He'd acquired the knowledge of lip-reading out of necessity on the power decks of the old chemical burners thirty years before, and while he couldn't hear what Tom had said, he knew what the report was. Very well, Corbett! He shouted not being able to judge the volume of his voice. Good job! Can't seem to pick them up at the academy again! Had them once, then lost them. I'm placing you in command of an expedition for a quick look outside. Arm yourselves with parallel ray guns and rifles. Take a jet boat, and in no circumstances are you to land. Dismissed! Oh, yes, one more thing. Uh, Take Alfie Higgins along with you and keep your eye on him. Report back in one hour! Tom felt a tingle of excitement run up his backbone as he heard the tough skipper give him permission to explore the planet. He saluted and turned away, Alfie trailing him down the ladder. Hey, Astro! yelled Tom. Get number one jet boat out of the hatch. We're going for a look-see at this place. Tom went to the gun locker and took out three parallel ray guns and rifles. He made sure each of them was fully loaded and then handed them to Alfie. Put these on the jet boat, Alfie. I'll be along in a minute. Alfie took the guns and walked toward the jet boat catapult deck. Tom returned to the radar bridge and stood before Connell. Would you see if there's any news of Roger, sir, when you make contact with the Academy? Connell read the cadet's lips and nodded his head. Tom turned and went directly to the jet boat deck. Astro and Alfie waited for him inside. Run along three spacesuits, Tom, said Astro. You can never tell what we might run into. Good idea, said Tom. The three cadets climbed into the jet boat, Tom taking the pilot's seat. He pushed a release button, and a portion of the Polaris's steel hull slid back. Tom pressed another button, gripped the wheel of the small spacecraft, and stepped on the acceleration pedal. The little red ship shot out of the open hatch and zoomed over the giant trees. Travelling at a slow speed... Tom made a wide arc over the forest, checking his position against that of the Polaris before losing sight of it. He pulled the tiny ship up to 1,000 feet, levelled off, set the automatic pilot, and took his first close look at Tara, four and a half light years from Earth. From above, Tara seemed to be a quagmire of reptiles, dinosaurs, and dense vegetation, reaching as high as the gleaming towers of Venusport and Atom City. Huge trees that spread their branches over an area of a thousand feet soared skyward, limbs and trunks wrapped in jungle creepers. Now and then Alfie would grasp Tom or Astro by the arm and point a wavering finger at a moving animal below, then gasp and fall back white-faced into his seat. While Tom was inclined to share Alfie's reactions, Astro took it in his stride, having been exposed to the dangers of wild jungles on his own Venus. The tiny jet boat raced across the blue-green sea that swept up into giant swells along the snow-white sandy beaches, 
It was a temptation to set the small craft down and enjoy the pleasure of a swim after the many days of cramped, tortured living on the Polaris. But Tom remembered Connell's orders, and also had a lot of respect for some of the things he had seen swimming in the water. Better get back, said Tom. He flipped the audiophone switch in the jet boat and spoke into a small mic. Jet boat one to Polaris, jet boat one to Polaris, cadet Corbett to Major Connell. There was a crackle of static, and then Connell's voice, vibrant and clear, filled the small cabin. Corbett! He roared. By the creators of Luna! I couldn't contact you! Return to the Polaris on the double! Is there something wrong, sir? Asked Tom, apprehensive after seeing the wildness of the jungle below him. Wrong? Blared Connell. News from Earth! From the Academy! Roger's been cleared of all charges! Cleared? Stammered Tom. Absolutely! When I sealed the radar bridge after the crash, a security officer examined the settings on the scanners and transmitting equipment. They showed that Roger had been on duty at the time, that he had been tracking the ship as he claimed. Then what was the reason for the crash? Security isn't sure yet. An acceleration control lever is missing from the wreckage, and it wasn't broken off as a result of the crash. Now Loring and Mason are wanted for further questioning. Tom looked at his unit mate Astro. The big Venusian had his head turned to one side. He seemed to be staring out over the vast, writhing jungle. Astro, did you hear? Asked Tom softly. Yeah. Mumbled Astro in a small, choked voice. Just don't ask me to turn around. End of chapter 11